Uh, and our next speaker actually is someone who grew up in one of those centers and has had a great career. Uh, uh, we actually grew up uh, very near each other and uh, I was uh, telling uh, uh, Mark that uh, uh, Mark is from uh, Silicon Valley and I, I tend to think of Silicon Valley as either a concept or a TV show. Uh, but, uh, but it's also uh, really a place, uh, conceptually, a place of great, of great innovation. Uh, uh, Mark spent 12 years as a partner at Sequoia Capital in Menlo Park, where he led investments in LinkedIn, Mark Logic, Cast Iron, and Funnier Funny, Funny or Die.com. And it was just over six years ago when Mark's friend, uh, Governor John Kasich, asked him to lead Jobs Ohio which at the time was the state's newly formed private economic development organization. Mark planned to come from California to Ohio for a little bit of time, uh, get Jobs Ohio started, and then um, uh, head on back. But he really fell in love with Ohio. We've talked about this, and I remember when I was first arriving, uh, we had a nice uh, chat, and he was saying, gosh, I came here and saw there was incredible opportunity and that uh, there was a, a real opportunity for the Midwest to develop more rapidly in, in the venture capital market. And so uh, Mark came and formed Drive Capital. He and his partners identified the Midwest as an untapped market with huge potential and it's, it's paying off. Uh, to date, Drive Capital has raised more than $550 million and invested in 26 companies. And what's more, Mark is a committed innovator, entrepreneur, and advocate who represents our community with great distinction here and around the world. He's a great friend and a great champion for us here in Central Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, our friend, Mark Kwame. Mark? Well, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, thank you very much, President Drake. Uh, I think his words were, uh, were a great way to kick us off. Uh, one thing he didn't mention, I also was able to attend a great public university, uh, Berkeley. Uh, University of California, Berkeley, and the importance of having a phenomenal university and system uh, for innovation is, is, uh, is just integral to making all this happen. I, I quite frankly, am honored to be here today. Uh, as many of you guys know, I came here as, I see Nate over there, hi. Uh, I came here as an economic development guy. I knew nothing about economic development. And I see some folks in the room today that taught me everything I know. The first person I see is Christy Tanner right there. I met her and we walked into the economic, we walked into the Deve Department of Development. It was just she and I and I knew nothing. Uh, her and Christy Klaus and Nate and, and many others kind of made it all happen. And then I got to meet Alex and Kenny uh, who are true pros in this area. And what you guys have done here in Central Ohio and throughout the whole state of Ohio is, is pretty spectacular. Uh, as President Drake mentioned, uh, I, I came here uh, at, the, at the invite of, uh, of Governor Kasich. I had never been, I, I was here once or twice before, but I knew nothing about Columbus, I knew nothing about Ohio, so I had to lean on these folks to teach me all the great things that are happening here. And I truly was just going to be here for six months. Uh, and as I was telling your, your keynote speaker for lunch, you know, I made the move that a lot of people make. I said, you know what, forget Silicon Valley, I'm coming to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing that is I truly believe that Columbus, Ohio and the Midwest, uh, the greater Midwest is going to be and has the potential to be the economic driver uh, of the country going forward. And it's similar to why we were the economic driver in the early 1900s, because location matters. We were, as we all know, one thing that Christy told me from the very beginning, you get in your car, uh, from Columbus, Ohio, you drive one day and you hit about 50, 60 percent of the pay, uh, uh, population in North America and its GDP. So I want to talk about today why I think this is going to happen. But first I must say, predicting the future is really hard. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to do it. This is a great quote from Thomas Watson, one of the founders of IBM. You know, I think the world market for computers is maybe five. How many of you have an iPhone in your, or a smartphone in your, I think there's more than five computers here. Uh, so uh, whatever I say today, take please with a grain of salt, we're going to do our best. Um, so what I want to do is give you a little bit of history first. So computing has been around for about 50 years. It first started uh, with the ENIAC computer. Do you know why the word bug happened? Because bugs would fly into the tubes and blow up the tubes and then the computer wouldn't work. That's, they were actually bugs, they weren't uh, anything else. The first wave was, was transistors, and my father is the founder of National Semiconductor. 
uh, in 1967, and the whole you know computing wave of the 60s and 70s and 80s and early 90s uh, was really driven by the mainframe. It was very computational in nature. It was very expensive. It was primarily a tool for the uh, uh, for the financial financial folks. In fact, in those days, all computing actually reported into the CFO, not the chief information officer, the CIO, as we know today. The interesting thing is. The first wave was very East Coast centric, very much towards you know Boston and New York and uh, you know Chicago to some degree and some other places. So it was mainly on the East Coast because those were what the financial centers uh, of the uh, of the United States. The next wave was the personal computer wave, and that was really driven by Moore's law. Uh, you know the guys at Intel, uh, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, started the first microprocessor, uh, the four four thousand four, and. Uh, what they were able to do is really grow this whole area. Now, this is when personal computers started to happen. That's when we, I started at Apple when I was 19 with my Apple II Plus, uh, and that was the beginning of my kind of career in the, in the technology world. So it started with the Apple II and went all the way through. Now, these things, were, these things brought costs way down, but people forget the Apple II in 1980 cost $2,500. That's a lot of money. You know, this thing right now, what's amazing to me about this, the, the iPhone, this is a 128 gig, four core, 64 bit microprocessor. Of 10 years ago, this is a half million dollar mini computer. Okay, so just something keep, keep, to keep in mind. So it became a general purpose tool, more and more people were using it. This is when you started to see things go to the West Coast. Companies uh, obviously like Microsoft up in Seattle, Apple in Silicon Valley, Sun, SGI. Of course, we still had Lotus, we still had IBM down in Boca Raton, we had Compaq in, uh, in Houston, but you know, you started to see you know, the, the computing power kind of move around. The next wave is truly the connected computer. This is when we you know, started putting them all together, putting our computers together through networking, and then you know, it grew up, and then uh, out of that came the internet, started out as the ARPANET, you know, Mark Andreessen from Indiana uh, built uh, the first web browser. Uh, he was then attracted and, 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 and moved out to the valley. And then, of course, we have these great Facebook uh, and Google and all the many uh, apps and, and so on and so forth. So this really allowed all of us to have access to information immediately. And one of the things the governor always likes to say, I met John and uh, Governor Kasich in uh, 1996, and he came out to the valley in 1997, 1998, and he asked me, Mark, what's the future? Uh, you know, how, only way he can do it. He's very good at you know, the penetrating question. And I said, it's the constantly connected consumer. Uh, we're going to be connected to all data, all the time, everywhere. That's what's going to happen in the future. And uh, I was sort of right. I think we're all connected, right? Uh, and that's kind of the age that we're in today. We're in the age of every person is not just a connector of information, but also a creator of information. We're all publishers of content. You know, we, when we send something out to Facebook, we send it to Instagram, even our president, when he goes out and does things on Twitter, he has now become a creator of information. Well, what happened there is something was interesting. All the big tech then moved to the West Coast. Uh, all these companies, primarily, other than maybe Amazon and Microsoft, most of these moved all to the West Coast because you, you were moving so fast and with such um, amazing uh, um, creativity and, and connectedness, you needed to all be together. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg moved his company from Boston to Silicon Valley, not for the money. He moved it because he needed a connective, he, he needed access to network engineers, he needed access to these sorts of folks. So, you know what's kind of interesting is everyone thinks, you know, you know technology's kind of been moving on at a certain pace. Technology is moving faster than we've ever seen before. So if you look at many of these products and technologies here, since these things did not exist or were created, uh, were in beta since 2006. You know, little things called the iPhone, you know, was, was launched in 2007. You, if you look at all of this technology in the last 10 years, over $2 trillion of value has been created. Now, we're all economic development folks out here. Guess what? That all happened in the, in the West Coast. I mean, trillions of dollars. I mean, it's crazy what has happened in, in, in value creation and what's happening in, in, in those areas. And that's why you have crazy real estate prices. You have all the nuttiness of Silicon Valley. 
but that's the main reason why you've had this, 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 this combination of all of these things happening there. So what I want to talk to you about today is what I like to call the fourth wave and why I believe the fourth wave is going to be very beneficial for all of us uh, in this room. But it's also going to bring its set of challenges, so I want to talk about the challenges as well. The fourth wave is truly the thinking machine. Okay, this is, this is something that's going to totally change everything. Okay, so we, we started with these computers. There were tools for us to, you know, basically fast calculators. Then, you know, we would take those fast calculators and allowed us to, us to program them ourselves through the personal computer. And then we connected them all together and so we can communicate more quickly. Now the machine is going to be thinking for ourselves. And this wave is going to be similar to the other ones. It's going to start with the, the, uh, the massively uh, parallel processing. Everyone's talking about, I'm sure our speaker at noon is going to talk about the driverless car, the autonomous vehicle. Well, the autonomous vehicle is programmed by one of these brains. The human brain, by the way, does about 2,000 teraflops. Okay, so now for five grand, I can buy 10% of the human brain. Okay, that, by the way, in 1996, one teraflop was about $5 million. Okay, so in 1996 to now, I can now buy 200 times that capability for five grand. Okay, so first you have a brain. Well, what does a brain need? A brain needs sensors. It needs things to touch. Okay, and if you look at whether it's an autonomous vehicle, you look at whether it's your iPhone, whatever it is, it's full of sensors. It's, it's sensing where you are, what you're doing. I mean, GPS is just a sensor of location, right? Uh, you know, you look at Wi-Fi, it's connecting, so on and so forth. So the sensors are your, or your touch, your feel, your hands, your eyes, you know, your sense of smell, your taste. Okay, that's what's giving you the data that your, your brain is going to process. The third is your memory. Okay, without memory, things can't work. I fundamentally believe we're going to enter a whole new wave of, of storing data. And as uh, President Drake mentioned, I was very fortunate to be the initial investor in LinkedIn. LinkedIn is basically a graph of everyone's relationships. It's how you know each other, how we put things, put things together. You know, I, I'm connected to Alex. Alex is connected to Attorney General DeWine. De, uh, Attorney General DeWine's connected to now John Husted. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> uh, so now I am three degrees from John Husted. So isn't that amazing? Uh, so what's happening now is data is happening the exact same way. We're now connecting all this data. And, you know, my wife is actually was one of the fastest growing companies in Columbus is doing uh, technology in and around this space. So now we have, we have thinking, we have the brain, computational, we have all our sensors everywhere, and now we have connected memory. Once you have that, you can now have machine learning. The machine is now going to learn. What is an autonomous, uh, Google just announced uh, the Waymo uh, cars have now driven 4 million miles. That'd be the same as I think the number was 300 years of us driving normally. And it's constantly learning. So when I make a mistake driving now, I learn from that mistake and then I drive better. But no one else, none of you learn from that mistake. When Alex goes out and makes a mistake and he does things and we're part of a connected uh, you know, car, I learn from Alex and Alex learns from Kenny. Kenny learns from Nate. All the, we all learn together. That's why this thing is happening so fast. I fundamentally believe in, uh, you know, in, um, in about three years, see if you think the same thing, I think in three years you will see an autonomous vehicle driving in and around Columbus every day of the week. All of us will. Okay? That's, it's not that far away. It's happening very, very quickly. So a good friend of mine, Sebastian Thrun, he is really seen as uh, one of the founders and uh, fathers, if you will, of the autonomous vehicle. He says this is just the beginning. He fundamentally believes that 75% of the workforce will be impacted by artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you are an accountant, if you are a legal assistant, if you are many things, the machine is coming to replace you. Economic development, never. But uh, <laughs> accountants, yes. But this is happening. And we're going to see the amount of change we're going to see in the next five to seven years is going to dwarf what I have seen in the last 35 because of this. 
And so we're going to have to figure out how not to be computational uh, beings, you know, taking something from one place to another and moving one spreadsheet to another, whatever. Machines will do that for us. As he says in the big, uh, at the bottom there, the winners will leverage AI to unfold human creativity because a machine cannot be creative. You enter something in the machine, the machine makes it happen. It will do it for you, okay, but the machine is not creative. So what does that mean? I think computational AI and all of this is going to take us to a whole new wave in the fact that, you know, when we started with uh, the mainframe, it was green screens for those of you around. Uh, then with the personal computer, we got Windows graphic user interfaces, then we had the connected computer gave us uh, both the, uh, uh, the internet uh, web browsers as well as, uh, as well as mobile interfaces. The next is truly voice, and we're just in the beginning of it, okay? How many of you guys are Star Trek fans? We're going to have, you know, Kirk saying, computer, what is this? What is that? Make me this, make me that. We are this close to having all that happen. So where is this going to happen? Where is this going to happen in the United States? Okay? Other than Columbus, Ohio. No. It's going to happen, I believe, here. And this is going to have a dramatic impact in our society in our culture and everything. This is, you may not know this, John. This is Yuri Milner. I thought this guy was nuts, okay? He comes from Russia. He decides he believed in, the, in uh, mid-2000s that the top computing companies will be worth 10 times what they're worth today. And so he invested a half a billion dollars at Facebook at a $15 billion valuation in 2000-something, 8, 9, 10, something like that. And you know, now you know, Facebook's worth 700 billion and he's done pretty well. Uh, he truly predicts that we're gonna see the exact same thing happen in the next 10 years, and I believe that too. The amount of value creation and the amount of economic stimulation that's gonna happen because of this digital economy is gonna be crazy. People ask me, I've been doing this for a long time, Mark, hey, tell me about the future. I don't know. It's happening so fast, I cannot tell you the world we're going to all live in in literally five to seven years. So, why do I believe it's going to happen in the Midwest? And, why, and I'm going to tell you why I think Columbus is a great place for it to happen. One is, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. You know, if you look at what's happening, we are still the economic engine uh, of the United States. We have 150 of the Fortune 500. We're the you know, number one regional area for producing computer science engineers. You have Carnegie Mellon, you have Purdue, you have Northwestern, you have Urbana-Champaign, you have The Ohio State University, you have Denison actually, he's got a fantastic computer science program. You have amazing universities, as President Drake said, they're, they're basically the fuel, if you will, for this, for this great thing. Next thing is we have a low cost of living. You know, an engineer here can actually buy a house uh, and, 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 and do things that you cannot do in Silicon Valley. I mean, the first house I bought, my starter home in Mountain View, California, was a 50-year-old home when I bought it. Okay, it was 1,400 square feet, three bedroom and one bath, and I bought it in 1989 for $144,000, which, by the way, even today here in Columbus is a lot of money for a house of that size. It's not in a very good neighborhood. That house today, I just looked it up, sold three months ago for $1.6 million, okay? It's nuts there. We got to use this as a big advantage. And as I mentioned, close to 60% of the GDP is here. What's interesting, though, is this could also devastate the Midwest. And I, I really want to have a, a talk about that. It is estimated in the next, 10 year, uh, next seven to 10 years, five to 10 million jobs, these are high paying jobs, will be lost because of artificial intelligence in the United States. Goldman Sachs has a third less traders today because it's algorithmic trading. These are, guys, these are guys and gals that were making a half a million dollars a year. Gone. Okay? It is happening very, very fast. People talk about the retail apocalypse, what's happening with, with Amazon. We have a lot of retail in the Midwest. We have a lot of jobs in the Midwest. We have got to be, we got to be ready for that, 
okay, could have a big impact on our, our, our economy. The other thing is, the good news is we have 150 to Fortune 500, but as many of you know, if you look at the top companies in the S&P 500 today versus they were 15 years ago, a lot of the ones that were the top ones 15 years ago are gone, okay? So we do have a lot of legacy companies. The good news is we, have, we can take that, if, if they grab onto the digital economy and really make this thing happen, they can be the leaders going forward, but they can also be squashed by the digital revolution. One thing that I saw, and you know, why I'm betting my career on Central Ohio, is I believe this is a phenomenal place for venture capital. Because we, we have the people, we have the talent, we have the companies, we need the engine or the, the, the engine for this is truly venture capital. 55% of the venture capital still goes into California. That's crazy, we gotta change that, okay? The last one, last point here I think is really important. And I've taught, you've, many of you have heard me talk about this in the past. We got to be, you know, failure is a really cool thing. You got to be willing to fail. Because if you don't fail, you haven't tried. I remember when I, was a, uh, I was a ski patrolman as a kid, and I was telling my, um, one of my uh, teachers, I, I, said, uh, I said, man, I had a, you know, great runs today. I didn't fall once. He said, well, you didn't learn anything. That's terrible. You got to fall. Because if you don't fail, you're not pushing yourself to the limit. And we got to go do that. So why, what would I do if I was sitting in, in your shoes today as an economic development person? I think, as, as I mentioned before, I think Central Ohio is perfectly positioned to significantly benefit from this. But as I said before, we've got to be careful. Because this is going so fast that we could be run over as well. We need to figure out how to work together and leverage all the wonderful things we have here. We have amazing companies here. The Cardinal Healths, the L Brands, the Huntington Banks. We have incredible companies here. We need to leverage that combined with an amazing university in, in, uh, in, in the Ohio State University. But we have other phenomenal universities here and, and colleges in the whole area. I had mentioned Denison. They have a, f a fantastic computer science program. We need to leverage this thing. And one thing that I was fortunate enough to do with Christy and the, and the team from Jobs Ohio that I, I'm one of the more things I'm proud about is we basically said in the past, you know, people would go to market as Cincinnati or Cleveland or, or Columbus. You know, what we said was, no, let's go to market as Ohio. The power of Ohio is much stronger than any individual place. I think the same thing is is, uh, is, is, is here in central Ohio. I happen to uh, spend most of my time in Muskingum County. It's a phenomenal place. Licking County, I mean, it's not just, I hate to say it, I'm sure there's some Franklin County. It's not just about Franklin County. It's about all of us together. We all gotta work together to really make this thing happen. The next thing is we need to focus on digital-centric companies, okay? It's great to have others but we need to think about that. And actually, Alex, one thing great about Columbus 2020 and the partnership is I was at a talk, uh, uh, when was that, Tuesday? And uh, they brought in somebody from Brookings and she's had some very interesting things to say. These are pictures I took of her slides, so I'm totally ripping off her slides. <laughs> um, so the changing, uh, uh, the rapid digitalization is changing the demand for skills. So in 2002, only 5% of, of jobs needed highly digital people, about 40% needed uh, you know, medium digital score. Today, that's gone from 45% to 70% of people need, and this, by the way, a digital, a medium person, someone knows how to use Excel and email. I mean, this is not a ton of knowledge, right? And now look, but the thing is, highly skilled people need 23% of the, of the jobs out there need to be that. Now, why is that important? The next slide. The average salary of a highly skilled digital person is $73,000. The average salary of a non-skilled digital person is only $30,000. We have got to, we need to embrace this. I was talking to, to Les over at uh, L Brands and, and we were talking about the fact that, and he, he, the guy's freaking brilliant. Um, he was just saying, you know, I gotta start thinking about company as a software, as a digital company that just happens to sell products. That's what Amazon is thinking. Amazon does not think of itself 
as a distributor of goods. It thinks of itself as a software company that is making, pro you know, that is shipping products. It's, it is not a distributor of products. We have to think about things in a digital-centric way. Next, we need, to be we need to be creative and go out of our comfort zones, okay? The reason why we have great wins like Facebook and, and, uh, and uh, Amazon data centers and things like that is we went out of our, uh, out of our, uh, out of our safety zones. We tried new things, okay, at Jobs Ohio and, and at, at Columbus 2020. We need to figure out new and creative ways to go grab these sorts of companies. And last but not least, I think one of the most uh, innovative guys I have met here in, um, in Central Ohio is Tom Feeney of SafeLight. Um, be like Tom. <laughs> he is constantly asking himself, what's going to kill my business? Or what's going to be around the corner? How can I do something better? I asked him, I said, Tom, you replace windshields. Why do you worry about that? He goes, well, autonomous vehicles are coming, and pretty soon they're going to drive themselves to the dealerships and get their windshields replaced. Okay, if I'm not there, I got a problem. I won't have a business. I mean, you have to think like that, okay? And you have to think going forward. And, and what he and Renee and their team is doing is, is truly, uh, I've, I've, I've been really enjoyed uh, working with him and, and, and all of their folks over there. So, okay, I'm telling you about the future. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, and mostly I'm wrong. But the nice thing about venture capital is 50% of the time I'm wrong. So you guys can pick what I th you think I'm right and what I'm wrong. But uh, if you guess, you're probably 50% right. So uh, this is always a little scary. So I was asked in 1997 to be part of a panel of, you know, pundits uh, and talking about the future. And I thought I'd play a little clip from it. It's actually pretty hilarious because when you see the woman's uh, question from the audience, uh, we'll tell you about the time. So let's play the, the video. internet. Or does it depend on the technology being available for me to pick up something in my hand and have a newspaper in the morning rather than going out to the front door and picking up a, a paper newspaper? I actually don't think it, I mean, everybody really should answer this. I, I don't think it depends upon anything. I think it's evolutionary and inevitable. You're at the very beginning of a radical transformation of everything we see, we hear, we know. There's no question about it. I mean, that, that just seems clear. This, this process is going to, is, is this internet process, this interactive process is going to provide it worldwide. And it's going to take time to gather its forces. And it's how long it will be, I haven't a clue, but uh -huh. a while. Uh, I, it, what's interesting to me is we are fundamental, I agree with that 100%. We are fundamentally changing how we communicate as a society, how we buy and sell products as a society, how we pass information. Everything is changing because of this wired world. And when it happens, and, and, and w when, it, when it happens for you or for me, is I now depend on it. Okay? I depend on real-time stock quotes. Okay? And that is the beginning for me. Okay, so when you begin to depend on it, when everyone in this room begins to depend on one aspect of it, it may not be real-time stock quotes for you, it may be something else, then it just starts to grow. Because one thing I also believe very strongly in is that you're not going to be looking at two million websites. You're going to be looking at probably four to five on, an, on a daily or weekly basis that fit your specific interests. Yeah, and once you've developed you that, for. those you will pay for and people will pay to get those messages in front of It's you. actually a simple answer. I mean, so, right now, you, know, you listed the things. So, this was done 20 years ago. Do you think we all depend on this now? Uh, the good news was I was sort of right. The bad news was I didn't truly believe it. Because I didn't invest, I actually helped launch Amazon, helped launch eBay, helped launch Yahoo, helped launch Google. I didn't buy stock in any of those companies. Okay, I'd be a trillionaire right now. <laughs> and, but I, I saw it happening, and you all see it too, but you have to act on it. You have to actually go out there and take a chance. You have to go out there and try something new. You have to, to use an you know, old term, seize the day. And what I'd ask you guys to do today is, just as I said 20 years ago, when we depend on it, it's going to change. Guess what, folks? 
The age of the thinking machine is happening. And pretty soon, I, in five, three, five, seven years, all of us will be depending on the machine thinking for us. And if we do not use our creativity, if we do not use the resources at hand, we are going to have, uh, uh, the amount of change is gonna roll right over us. And so what I believe, and why I bet my career on Central Ohio and bet my career on the Midwest, for the next hopefully 50 years I am here, is I believe this place has the potential to actually be the next center of all of this because we are where the GDP is. We are where the educational institutions are. We are where the top corporations are. Today, it is less important to be close to the technologist. It is more important to be close to the customer, to be close to the corporation who knows these things. So, as we kick off today, I wanna to thank you very much for your time, but I want to leave you with this. We have the opportunity to be the economic engine of the future. Go seize the day. Thank you.